Hi, my name is Lavinia and this is Peter. Welcome to Games Made Easy, a channel to learn board games quickly and easily. Today, to help our friends Rosie and Faris, I'm going to teach you how to play Betrayal at House on the Hill. Now, Betrayal is a bit more complicated than your average gateway game, but it's well worth learning it. I love it because it's like you and your friends suddenly are plunged into a Scooby-Doo episode or one of those 50s B-movies. It's absolutely brilliant. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. In Betrayal at House on the Hill, you play a group of explorers investigating a creepy old mansion together. What could go wrong, right? Well, in this three to six player game, you first work together to explore possibly the haunted house and it changes you and your companions. Then at some random point, a player triggers a scenario called the haunt. That's when it all becomes a tad crazy. One explorer becomes a traitor, fighting the other companions who now become heroes trying to stay alive. The game has 50 haunt scenarios and each tell a different story with different victory conditions. To win, you need to complete your side's victory conditions first, either as a traitor or as the group of heroes. Now, to set up the game, each player must pick an explorer, there are six of them, each with two sides. It's best if you check with the group to make sure that the party is balanced. Each mini has a character. So for example, she can be Heather Granville or Jenny Leclerc. We know her age, her height, her weight, her hobbies, and her birthday. We also know two physical traits, speed and might, and we know two mental traits, which are sanity and knowledge. The green number here is your starting point at the beginning of the game. Use these plastic clips to mark it. Now, if the game says that you take physical damage, you can choose whether you take speed or might damage. And, but if it says you take speed damage, then it's speed damage. Same goes for mental damage. There's no real maximum on the traits, but there is a minimum. And during the first phase of the game, you can lose traits and nothing will happen. Once the haunt starts, one of your traits gets to the skull and you're dead. So once the party is selected, it's time to set up the house. You take the starting tile with the three rooms and you place it in the middle of the table. Then you add the basement and the upper landing sufficiently apart from the main tile. Then you're going to mix all the other room tiles and you put them face down now you will shuffle the omen cards and as well place them face down the event cards and the item cards you have eight custom dice and just keep them close by then you place all your minis in the entrance hall ready to start the exploration we also have monster tokens but those we'll use during the haunt and we have some marker tokens that we might need when we explore the house. Once you're done with setup, you can start playing the game. So have a look at your character's birthday. It's written on the character card. The, the player who starts is the one whose birthday is coming up next from the date you're playing the game. Then you proceed clockwise, taking turns to explore the house. At your turn, you can make as many of the following actions. You can move, you can discover new rooms, you can use an item or an omen card, you can attempt a die roll, you can make an attack once per turn, once the haunt starts. Now, let's have a look at how you move. Your speed tells you how many rooms you can move. So this character has a speed of four, so it can potentially enter four rooms. Note that you can move, take actions and move again. But as soon as you draw a card, that ends your movement. Also note that the entrance, the foyer and the grand staircase is one same tile, but it counts as three separate rooms. 
So say it's Zoe's turn and she wants to move one and then she'll go into this doorway. There's no room behind. So to discover it, you draw the top tile of the room stack. If it has the name of the floor you're in, which in this case she's in the ground floor, it says ground, then you place it in the doorway matching the rest of the house as logically as possible. Then she moves into the room and it's been discovered. All doors are open except the front door. The staircases connect the floors. The grand staircase connects to the upper landing. If a doorway or window doesn't lead anywhere, then it's a false feature, like here, for example. If the only possible placement of a room seals off the floor, you have to discard it. If you run out of tiles, you shuffle the discard and you pick again. Some rooms, when you enter, they have certain conditions. Just make sure you read them. This one, for example, when you leave the room, you have to do something. There's a room that has, you enter here and it has a barrier. In order to get to the other side, you need to do something. You can attempt it once per turn. Monsters, however, don't have any issue with a barrier and they can just go through. Check the rules for other special rooms like the coal chute, the collapsed room, the junk room and the mystic elevator. As soon as you enter a room and you discover a symbol like this, this is an event card or an item or an omen card, then you draw that card. Note that drawing a card ends your movement, but you can still take other actions like using an item. You Also, you draw the card by discovering a room by walking into it using another tile or another card. If it's because of a haunt instruction, you do not draw a card. When the explorers draw a card, they read it aloud and follow the instructions. Now, most event cards will be discarded while all item and omen cards are kept in play and now belong to the explorer. You can use that item immediately unless it says otherwise. After drawing an omen card, if the haunt has not yet begun, you must make a haunt roll. Roll six dice at the end of your turn. If it's less than the total number of omen cards in play so far, the haunt starts. If this happens, that play is called the haunt revealer. So for example, with five omen cards in play, you would need a roll of four or lower for the haunt to start. In our house, we use this to keep track of how many omen cards are in play. Immediately refer to the haunt chart at the beginning of the traitor's tome. Refer to the room the haunt revealer was in and which omen was just drawn. The corresponding haunt number is the haunt you will now play. All explorers can use items. Some monsters can too. And most omen cards are treated like items. Once per turn, you can use an item you can trade an item with another player in the room. You can drop any number of items. So for example, Zoe has the puzzle box. So she can drop the item in the room and say Ox can come into the room and he can pick up that item. Ox has now the puzzle box. You can steal an item, but that's a special attack. There are exceptions to these and are written on the cards. In case of conflict, always use the rules on the card. Now, let's look at the haunt. As soon as the haunt is declared, the traitor takes the traitor's tome and leaves the room. To set up the haunt, just follow the instructions given in both booklets and do not share your respective objectives. The first turn always starts with the player on the left of the traitor. The heroes play first, then the traitor, and then if the traitor has monsters, they go next. Now let's look at some of the specific rules of the haunt because the traitor has some special powers. One, it can use the beneficial text but ignore the harmful text in rooms like this one for example. Two, you can choose whether you're affected or not by an event card or the bite omen card but choose before making the die roll. Three, after your turn move and attack with all the monsters if they're in play. Now, monsters also have special powers. However, they cannot discover new rooms or carry an item. Some haunts have a tra hidden traitor. Take monster tokens of one color, numbered from one up to the number of players. Shuffle and distribute one to each player. The person who has the number one is the hidden traitor. 
Now, attack is also one of the biggest differences in the haunt. You can attack once per turn. To attack, both players roll the number of dice equal to their might. In this case, Heather would roll three dice and Ox would roll five. The one with a higher number deals physical damage. So in this case, Ox has one, and the damage is the difference between the two rolls. This is an epic roll, so the difference is three. So Heather loses three physical damage. Sometimes an effect allows you to attack with another trait than might. In that case, the opponents would roll on that trait. And if you attack with a mental trait, you inflict mental damage. Just like before the haunt, you can still distribute damage between might and speed if it's physical and sanity and knowledge if it's mental damage. Remember that this time, if you reach the skull in any of your traits, your explorer is dead. If you die, all your items and any companions you may have stay in that room. Monsters do not die, they are stunned. Now also, some weapons allow you to attack at range in the next room within line of sight, like the revolver. In this case, you don't take damage if you lose the attack roll. You can also steal an item if you inflict more than two points of damage. Of course, you cannot steal with a distance attack. Finally, you can steal with any successful attack on a stunned monster without having to trade the two points. Now, another big difference during the haunt is movement. Monsters move differently. You roll the number of dice equal to their speed. For example, the witch, she has a speed of four, so you would roll four dice. In this turn, she can move two. That's her movement for this round. For groups of monsters, you only roll once. These zombies here, they have a speed of two. So this round, they'll move three. You will find their speed in their description in the trader's tone. Enemies slow you down. So each opponent in a room costs one extra movement to leave the room. Heroes slow down the monsters and vice versa. So here, Zoe, she has a speed of five. So in order to leave the room, she would only be able to move four. Now, if they're in the room together, Ox and Heather are not affected by this because they're in the same team. Note that no matter how many penalties, you can always move at least one. My tips to win a betrayal is to stay alive. No, seriously, before the haunt, try to collect as many items and gain as many points on your traits as you can, because once the haunt starts, it'll be a bit more difficult. After the haunt, you can still explore and discover new rooms and objects. It's just not as easy. Now, my next piece of advice, I wish I'd had the first time I played Betrayal, and that is once the haunt is revealed, take your time. It's a trap to think you need to jump straight into it. Some of the haunts are a bit complicated and it's much better if you take a step back and see what you need to do with a group before jumping into it. It'll make for a much better game in the end. Also, don't forget to use all those items and special powers you've collected. You'll see that every time you play the game, it's completely different. You'll have to adapt to your character, to the other players and to the haunt. The game ends with the first side to complete the goals of the haunt. The winning side reads the winning section out loud. That's how you play Betrayal at House on the Hill. A simple and effective role-playing game guaranteed to make an evening to remember. It's great with three to six players, the more the merrier, and it'll take about an hour to play. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe, or leave in the comments a game you'd like us to teach. We'll make more games easy soon. Bye now.